Welcome back to the morning session of the workshop. So today we have Manuel Sanz from um, Udelar, Uruguay, who's going to present us the price of Inginerous. Very nice title, <laughs> looking forward. The floor is yours, uh, Manuel. Thank you very much. OK. First of all, I will warn you that I am heavily jet lagged, so I hope this goes OK. If I spontaneously start speaking in Spanish, it's because I had a little bit of a breakdown. You just say me, like, switch back to English, and I will do my best to do it. OK, so this is a collaboration with other three authors, two of which are here, John and Marco somewhere, maybe. And a Tian Chi that couldn't make it, he's working in, in China. OK. The model I will be discussing is a model that already came up at least once during the talks. So hopefully you already have some kind of familiarity and this will make everything a little bit smoother. So the general setting is a setting in which uh, the statistician has some certain data available, which is structured in a, in a matrix. This matrix is a full rank matrix and for some reason, Within this full rank structure, there is a low rank structure that is of interest for the statistician. So the idea is to try to extract this low rank structure from the full rank structure. There are many applications, for example, in community detection uh, and group synchronization that I will not dive into, but this is in general a very uh, recurring problem uh, in this kind of, of topics. This is, in a way, a, a kind of inference model for PCA in the sense that the kind of task that you're trying to do is essentially the same of kind of task that is solved by PCA. But the difference is that PCA that does not incorporate a prior information about the signal or the model in general into a, the estimator that it gives you. And the idea is to have PCA as a kind of comparison background uh, to see the performance of this kind of estimators. So what I'm going to discuss is this task of obtaining a low rank uh, signal out of a full rank data matrix in the setting in which one assumes that the uh, high rank noise, which is a kind of additive noise in the data matrix one is observing, it's not the uncorrelated uh, Wigner Gaussian uh, matrix that is in the typical uh, models, but the matrix instead has some kind of structure. So a little bit the logic of assuming this is that, okay, one has certain problem in which one wants to apply these techniques and wants to extract this low rank structure for some reason. But the data matrix that, uh, the full rank data matrix that is available the thing that one calls noise is in fact some kind of information. It's not really noise in the traditional sense. Okay, it's something in which you're not interested, so you want to, uh, in a way, forget about it. But it has some kind of structure because the distribution it comes from is a highly structured distribution because this is a data set that comes from a real situation. And the kind of question we want to answer is, okay, you have this setting in which the data matrix you have is a data matrix that comes from some structured distribution, and you want to extract this low rank uh, signal from the high rank uh, data matrix, but you don't have detailed information about the distribution where uh, the high rank component comes. So in a way, one naive proposal would be to forget about the structure in this uh, matrix and model it as a Gaussian matrix, which is essentially a matrix that has no structure at all, right? And the idea will be to answer the question of, okay, by do, using this kind of naive model on this structured uh, matrix, what are the things that are you're losing by doing so? And that's why the title of the talk is uh, The Price of Ignorance. Okay. And in particular, we are going to study a low rank matrix estimation. I forgot to mention the name of the problem. Uh, in which, as I mentioned, 
the noise matrix, whatever you call noise, is some kind of a matrix that comes from a structure distribution, but the statistician models it wrongly as a Gaussian matrix. And in this setting, the main results of the talk will be a characterization of the Bayesian estimator that wrongly assumes uh, the noise to be Gaussian, so it's a heavily mismatched uh, estimator, and the characterization of AMP that also wrongly assumes that the noise matrix is Gaussian, so the, there will be parts of the algorithm which are incorrect in a sense. And from these two theoretical characterizations that we have, then we have a, a whole variety of phenomenology that appears which have very interesting uh, kind of implications which I will discuss a little bit. Okay, but before diving into the problem, the structure problem, I want to discuss a little bit the traditional model in which uh, you want to extract a rank one matrix out of a full rank matrix and really you have an additive noise which is Gaussian. So I want to discuss a little bit this setting before specializing in the uh, new results. Okay, so being more precise, the kind of things we have in this case is that uh, the statistician has some data matrix, which is this Y, which is equal to this rank one matrix, which is the P. As you can see, the P is a rank one matrix uh, built out of a random vector, which is the X star. We will call this the signal that we want to infer. And then there is an additive uh, Gaussian noise. And this parameter lambda star, which is the signal to noise ratio. During the talk, there will be two signal to noise ratios. This one, which is lambda star. Keep in mind that not in this setting, but in the setting uh, of the work we, we did, there will be another signal to noise ratio, which will be the lambda without the star. And this lambda star will be really the signal to noise ratio involved in the data generating mechanism, while the lambda will be the signal to noise ratio assumed by the statistician. And we will allow in the model we, we discussed, not here, for these two values to be different. Okay, so you want to infer this random vector X star, and you have this uh, Gaussian additive noise here. In this setting, because the real distribution of the noise is Wigner, you have that the distribution of this random matrix is proportional to this uh, density over here, this uh, factor exponential of trace two of z squared. And this implies that the log likelihood of the model, the log likelihood that will appear on the posterior distribution, will have this quadratic form. This quadratic form comes directly from the quadratic expression that uh, is from the distribution of the noise. Okay, in here I write some simplifications in two special cases, in the cases in which uh, the prior uh, you're using for the posterior has a, a support over a, a fixed norm. So it can be two cases. Here I wrote in the slides that the prior is uniform on the sphere because here when you distribute the square, you remove, you add it in this constant, the factor that has uh, the term of the norm but it could also be a, a, a product of n Rademachers, the prior, which would give you a, a vector which is uniform in the hypercube. In that case also, the norm would be fixed and would be equal to square root of n, and it will be incorporated into these constants over here. Okay, so this form of the log likelihood will be important for us because here I am discussing the log likelihood of the model that where the data generating mechanism is, uh, has a Gaussian noise, but also the model models uh, the data as having Gaussian noise. In the setting we will consider later, the data generating mechanism will be different, so this matrix Z will not be a Gaussian, but still because the statistician is not aware of this discrepancy, the posterior proposed by the statistician will be the same. So we will still have this same kind of expression. 
Okay, in this setting, there is plenty of literature available. I just um, mentioned here a couple of them. Some of the people here in the audience have been authors of this uh, kind of uh, works. But in a nutshell, in this context in which uh, you have a, a data matrix that really has an additive Gaussian noise and the model has no mismatch, in a sense, everything is known. So the characterization of the usual quantities one would be interested in, for example, for the Bayesian estimator, uh, uh, characterizing the limiting uh, mean square of the estimator, or characterizing uh, the evolution of A and P, this has essentially all been done. In the particular context of the Bayesian estimator, here the Bayesian estimator is, well, in the slides I didn't write the meaning of this bracket, but this bracket means a mean expectation with respect to the posterior. So expectation with respect to the measure that has the log likelihood that was on the previous slide. So it would be the measure that has this expression in the exponents. Mm. This is not working, okay. Has this expression in the exponent plus a prior. In this context, uh, the Bayesian estimator is then uh, taking expectation with respect to the posterior to the matrix uh, uh, constructed in terms, the rank one matrix constructed in terms of uh, samples from the posterior. So it would be this expression over here. And what you have is that for characterizing the asymptotic error committed by this estimator, it's usually useful uh, to analyze the asymptotics of this auxiliary quantity, which in Bayesian terms would be the log evidence, or in more statistical physics terms, it would be the log partition function. The details of, of this quantity, they are not really important for, for the talk in a sense, we will characterize it, but the important thing is that this quantity in a way, uh, when you study the asymptotic value of this quantity, it characterizes uh, the asymptotic value of certain uh, order parameters that are important uh, in these problems. For example, in this particular case in which the data generating mechanism uh, includes an additive Gaussian noise and the statistician is aware of this uh, structure of the data and is modeled correctly, you have this relationship which is, if you characterize the limit of this quantity scaled correctly, which is divided by n, and you take a derivative with respect to lambda, that is the assumed signal to noise ratio, then you have that this limit characterizes exactly the mean square error of the Bayesian estimator. Okay, nice. And in this case, this kind of result exists. So we know what is the, the limit of this normalized uh, log evidence or log partition function, which is in terms of this optimization potential. And because this is known, then uh, the mean square error of the base estimator is also known. So one of the contributions, one of the things we did in this work is to have an analogous result, but in the mismatch setting I was mentioning before. Okay, so what is the model we really explore? The model we really explore is a model in which we have a data matrix which is similar uh, to the one I was describing before. So this looks exactly the same, right? We have a data matrix which is a, an, an addition between a, a term proportional to a matrix of rank one plus a full rank matrix, which is Z. The only difference in, in this data matrix is that now this Z is not a Wigner matrix, so it doesn't have this uh, Expo exponential of trace of z squared kind of density, but it is a rotational invariant uh, matrix. So it's constructed by making a sandwich uh, between a, a diagonal matrix and two uh, uniform orthogonal matrices. A sandwich in which the bread would be the orthogonal matrices and the cheese would be this diagonal matrix. And we will be always assuming that this diagonal matrix has some elements that uh, if you take the, the, 
empirical measure of the elements of this matrix, it converges weakly to some well-defined limits that has some kind of regularity assumptions that we need for the proofs. For example, we need this to converge to a distribution that has a compact support, and we need for the eigenvalues, the largest and minimum eigenvalues of the distribution to converge to the limits of the support. And another technical condition that it's not really to the point. But the important part in our model, the important thing is that, uh, okay, so now the noise is not a Wigner matrix, so the distribution of this is much more general, right? Because a Wigner matrix, you can think like a rotational invariant matrix that has a really specific uh, diagonal matrix here. Because Wigner matrices, matrices are rotational invariants, but they have a spectral distribution which is very particular. Here we are allowing for much more diverse spectral distributions in this diagonal matrix. But the thing is that, okay, although this is the data generating mechanism, so really the data is coming from this additive noise that has all this structure, uh, the statistician is not aware of all this complexity in the structure, so one naive proposal of what to do in these settings is to say, okay, there is something complex going on, I don't know what it is, so a default hypothesis would be to just assume that the noise is Gaussian. Of course, this is not correct, but this is a typical assumption that in a lot of real uh, practical situations is, is used, right? And the motivation for this is really this one. Okay, you have this data matrix that could be structured, but maybe you're not aware of this. So if you're really implementing this mismatched uh, model in which you're assuming this naive uh, Gaussian hypothesis, what is the impact in the inferent, in the inferent task by, uh, when you do so? And the kind of results we have include a vari variety of estimators. Uh, we divided them in three families. The first family of estimators are the spectral estimators because they are estimators that all are constructed in terms of the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. This is in principle a kind of a family of natural estimators the most typical of this is PCA, which is just constructing the rank one matrix uh, corresponding to this uh, largest eigenvector. This exactly corresponds to uh, the maximum likelihood estimator in the case in which uh, you have a prior which is uh, uniform on, on the sphere or, uh, or Rademacher. But as you can see, there are other two estimators that we consider, which we call the Gaussian PCA and optimal PCA. What is the meaning of this? So these other two estimators, they are essentially PCA, but with a constant in front. Why would be a good idea to put a constant in front of PCA estimator? Okay, these constants will depend at least in the signal to noise ratio. Why is it a good idea? Okay, imagine you are in the situation in which you have some data matrix, but the signal to noise ratio is really small. One knows by theoretical results that the correlation between uh, this eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue and the signal you want to infer beyond some certain threshold is really small. It's vanishing uh, with n. So in these cases, if you use a PCA estimator, because PCA estimator is, is a matrix that has norm one, you're really, uh, this is a bad estimator in, in, the, in the situations in which there is no signal inside your data matrix, right? Because if there is no signal inside your data matrix, your uh, mean square error will be much smaller if your estimator is exactly zero. So in these cases, you would like for your spectral estimator to have a constant in front, which if the data matrix you have has no information about the signal, that constant should be zero. And in that case, you would be estimating much better than if you're using PCA. And when the signal is really strong, maybe you want the constant to be one. And in middle situations in which the signal to noise ratio is large enough for the data matrix to have some information, but not a strong correlation with the signal, you want this constant to be uh, something intermediate between zero and one. So 
then why do we have two PCA estimators with this uh, adaptive constants that uh, tune the amount of information your data set has? Okay, because there is an optimal way of putting a constant when you have this structural add additive noise, which depends on the structure, really on the spectral distribution of the noise matrix. So if you have information about uh, the real distribution of the noise matrix, you could put a constant here that depends on lambda that would be optimal in a sense, that would really adapt to the real strengths of the signal you have in your data matrix. But if you're not aware of this, oh, sorry, you could do, still do this of putting a constant, but if you're assuming that the noise is Gaussian, you would put another constant in front, which would be the optimal constant in the setting in which uh, you really have a data generating mechanism that has an additive Gaussian noise. So we consider these two scale PCA estimators, one with the optimal Gaussian constant and one with the optimal, with the real optimal constant that uh, takes into account the real distribution of the data. Again, in this setting, we also want to uh, characterize the Bayesian estimator, which the definition of the Bayesian estimator now is exactly the same as in the uh, setting of Gaussian noise without a mismatch. That is, Bayesian estimator is the expectation with respect to the posterior of the rank one matrix that comes from a sample of the posterior. So it's it, this expression over here. But the difference with the setting in which you have additive Gaussian noise without a mismatch is that now, okay, you're taking an expectation with, with respect to the posterior, but now the posterior is mismatched. So this is not the correct posterior in the sense that your, the posterior does not refl reflect correctly the data generating mechanism. In particular, we allow for three kinds of mismatch here. One is that uh, the posterior we're going to consider only uh, has uh, uniform spherical priors, but the signal might, be, might come from another distribution. We also consider the setting in which uh, the statistician doesn't know the real signal to noise ratio of the data matrix, and so maybe the signal to noise ratio proposed inside the posterior is not the correct one. That's why we have the difference between uh, lambda star and lambda. So remember, lambda star is the real signal to noise ratio used in the data generating uh, mechanism, and lambda is the signal to noise ratio implemented inside uh, the posterior. And also, the main uh, mismatch in our posterior will be that our posterior will be the posterior corresponding to Gaussian noise but the data generating mechanism comes from this rotational invariant uh, distribution. Okay, one important point is that because we are in a mismatch setting, there are a lot of analytical tools that come, uh, that allow to analyze uh, base optimal settings that cannot be used in this setting. So you have to work around some technical problems when you have these mismatches. And there is also the problem that is the general problem with the Bayesian estimator that in high dimensions, there is a, it's non-trivial to approximate the Bayesian estimator. So you need efficient algorithms to try to implement it. And finally, the last setting of estimators we analyze are AMP algorithms. There are two AMP algorithms we analyze. One is Gaussian AMP, and the other one we call it Alternatively, I think in some slides it's referred as true AMP, and in other slides uh, it's referred as correct AMP. Don't mind the difference, they are the same, essentially. And the difference between them is that uh, in Gaussian AMP, that is the AMP that the statistician that uh, implements a model for the data which uh, has a, an additive Gaussian noise, so this is a, a mismatch AMP would use. It's the AMP that has the onsider corrections corresponding to uh, the Gaussian setting. But the true or correct AMP will be a, another AMP that has onsider corrections that uh, are fitting the real spectral distribution of the rotational invariant noise. Here there is a mistake. I was trying to write, oh, 
it's not working exactly properly. Okay, here there is a derivative missing, but the idea is for you to see that the kind of Gonzaga corrections that were in the Gaussian AMP. And the idea is to take all these estimators, characterize them in the high dimensional limits with some theory, and then to using these characterizations in the high dimensional limits to compare the performances of, of, of all of them. Okay, one quick comment is that, as I was mentioning before, because in the Bayesian estimator, we're using a model in which the data is, is assumed to be Gaussian, then the log likelihood that will be used in the Bayesian estimator will be exactly the one we saw before. So it will be exactly uh, the same log likelihood which is here, the one that will be appearing. And the good thing is that because we will be analyzing cases in which we have a, Gaussian, a, a uniform prior on the sphere, this expression over here can be interpreted as a rank one spherical integral. So this is something we will exploit for the uh, high dimensional characterization. Okay, the first of the main results is the characterization of the model corresponding to the posterior in the previous slide. There are these two functions which cor correspond in statistical mechanics jargon to magnetization and overlap. That's why we use the usual letters to, to, dis to designate disorder parameters. We have for disorder parameters uh, asymptotic values, which are these two functions. See that the limit of these two order parameters depend on these param two parameters, which are lambda and lambda star. Remember, lambda is the assumed signal-to-noise ratio, and lambda star is the real signal-to-noise ratio. So these two values appear in, the, in both limits of the order parameters. And using the limit of these two order parameters, you can compute the limits of the mean square error of this mismatched uh, Bayesian estimator. Okay, here is a little comment that this H bar and this R, this is a still just transform of the real distribution of the noise, and the H bar is another associated parameter, so in these two expressions, the real distribution of the noise matrix appears through this, uh, this function and this quantity here. Okay, and a couple of very brief comments about the proofs that are involved in this uh, high dimensional formula. One issue we have here, as I told you before, is that because this is a mismatch setting, there are things that are lost, some analytical tools that cannot be used in this setting. For example, this kind of easy relationship between the limits of the log evidence, the scaled log evidence or the scaled uh, log partition function, free energy, whatever is your favorite name, is not trivially related to the MSC as it, as it was in the non-mismatch case. So here, to, think, to like work around a solution to, to the lack of this relationship, which is the IMMC formula, you have to consider a more general setting, which is not exactly the one we were saying before, but a setting where the real, the noise you consider to have is the real structure noise, which is the Z, plus a little Gaussian noise. And the thing you have to do is to compute the free energy, the limiting free energy for this perturbed setting. Because now, this little Gaussian perturbation allows you to access the limiting value of the overlaps which appear in the uh, MSC formula I, I proved before. And the good thing is that when you consider the setting where the prior is uniform on the sphere, you can compute the limit of the free energy of this uh, log partition function that I wrote many slides before over here. So you can compute the limit of this quantity divided by n in the mismatch setting when you have a uniform prior on the sphere by using results on the asymptotic value of rank one spherical integrals and the spectral distribution of rank one perturbations of uh, structure matrices. Yeah. With respect to the epsilon, yeah. 
AIH convex. No, but still you have the, re the usual relationship with the derivatives and you can work it out. Uh, and using this limit for the free energy, you can access the magnetization and the overlap. The magnetization will be related to derivatives with respect to the real signal to noise ratio, lambda star, and the overlap with respect to the parameter epsilon that was introduced by this perturbation. Of course, because this perturbation was artificial, it's not really in the model we are analyzing, then we have to take a limit of this perturbation parameter going to zero, but all the limits will work out, and then you have your uh, mean square error formula in the end. And the second main, main result we have is the characterization of the Gaussian wrong AMP, wrong in the sense I was saying before that the outsider corrections are the ones corresponding to a Gaussian model and not to the real structured noise that the data matrix has. And the kind of, char uh, of characterization we have for this AMP is the usual kind of characterization. We have a characterization of all the iterates until time t in terms of asymptotic random variables that I have described by some state evolution recursion. So this is essentially what is written here. And all this is in some specific metric that is the Wasserstein metric. Well, and a brief description of the proof techniques here. The idea is to write an auxiliary AMP, which has a correct denoiser that in a way corrects for the wrong on Sager uh, term that is implemented by the Gaussian AMP. And the idea is that because the denoiser is chosen to correct this, but it still falls in the theory of uh, orthogonal invariant AMPs uh, that can be found, for example, in this work, we go back to a theory to characterize the asymptotic value of this auxiliary AMP, which falls within that theory, and then using this characterization of this auxiliary AMP, we prove that the auxiliary AMP is really close to this Gaussian incorrect AMP, and we prove a kind of uh, asymptotic bounds in, in L2, and we see that if we can track the auxiliary AMP, essentially we're also tracking the wrong uh, Gaussian AMP. Okay, so we have this asymptotic characterization for a Gaussian AMP and for the mismatched uh, base estimator. And here what we do is to use these two character theoretical characterizations that, that we rigorously built in the work, and we compare two characterizations of the other estimators we were considering that I described before. And we have a whole variety of these nice pictures, which shows the asymptotic behavior of all these estimators. We'll mention maybe just a couple of them, if you want to really see the simulations and, I don't know, have a more detailed comparison, you can go back to the, to the work. Uh, for example, in here we consider a setting in which the noise is not really structured, it's really Wigner, but there is a mismatch in the, only in the signal to noise ratio. So this is a milder mismatch than the general mismatch considered in the, in the model we analyzed. And we're taking the assumed signal to noise ratio, which is lambda, to be two times the real signal to noise ratio. So in a way, what is the resulting model? The resulting model is a model which is correcting the kind of distribution it implements, but it's over optimistic. It is like assuming that you have much more signal in your data that, than you really have. And this has a, a kind of nice behavior. This shows a kind of nice behavior in, for example, the uh, Bayesian estimator, which is the dashed uh, green line over here. I don't know how the colors are seen, if it's good enough. You see that now the MSC, uh, the limit of the MSC is not monotonous in the, here I think this should be really lambda star, the real, the real signal to noise ratio. It's not monotonous in the real uh, signal to noise ratio. And there, there is an easy in, intuitive interpretation of this. If you're really optimistic and you think you have much more uh, signal intensity in your data, you will be overestimating the norm that you should give to your estimator. Like if you think that there's much more signal in your data, you will make the uh, estimator you have 
to have a much larger norm. But then there is not so much signal. So you put a large norm in your, your estimator, but you should, you should really put a smaller norm. So in a way, you're making your MSC larger than, than it should be. And that's why you have these little peaks over here. Another thing is that, that comes from the theoretical results, is that there is an interesting uh, relationship between Gaussian PCA and uh, the mismatch Bayesian estimator. In this case, for example, Gaussian PCA does something which is similar. It has a similar phase transition in which the, the MSC starts to be decreasing again. You see both of them start increasing at some point and then they become decreasing again. And these things happen at the same time. And this comes from the, the, the fact that they are both assuming the same kind of noise distribution, but they don't have exactly the same values. But we will see that in a lot of settings of uh, structured noise, uh, Gaussian PCA and this mismatch Bayesian estimator, they do essentially the same. There is another interesting behavior, which is that this Gaussian AMP is not doing the same as the uh, mismatch Gaussian estimator. So even though this Gaussian AMP is implementing the same model as the posterior you have, the mismatch posterior, they are doing different things. And you can see that in all the simulations we have, always this uh, Gaussian AMP is having a worse uh, performance. And as you can see in this setting in which you have the Wigner noise and a uniform prior, the AMP that implements the correct on sire corrections and uh, the optimal PCA, they are doing the same and they are the best estimators. And that is kind of natural because these are the estimators that have really the true uh, noise distribution. Here, uh, this is a more mismatched setting because we are considering a noise matrix that has some uniform spectrum between uh, these two values. These two values are only fixed so that uh, the eigenvalues in the spectrum of the noise uh, have variance one. So this is comparable to a, Wigner matri a standard Wigner matrix. And as you can see, in this setting, uh, Gaussian PCA and base PCA, they match exactly, which was not the case before. So there is a kind of interesting and complex relationship between this Gaussian uh, PCA and the mismatch Bayesian estimator. And again, we observe that uh, the Gaussian AMP is doing worse than uh, with respect to all the other estimators, and the estimator is different from the mismatched uh, Bayesian estimator. And the similar behavior is seen also if we implement, uh, if we study the problem in which now the real data generating mechanism has some additive rotational invariant noise with some marchenko pasteur spectrum of aspect ratio equal to one. In this case, the picture is very similar to the situation in which the mismatch was only uh, in, the, in the signal to noise ratio, but the relationship between the uh, Gaussian PCA and Bayesian estimator now inverts. Now here you can see that the Bayesian estimator is doing worse than uh, the Gaussian estimator and the places of the phase transitions, now they don't exactly match. You can see that the uh, Gaussian, um, the mismatch Bayesian estimator starts making worse predictions before Gaussian PCA. And another intuition that we had from the theoretical results is that if you plot the overlap of all these estimators in the case in which uh, the prior is uniform on the sphere, you can see that the behavior of the overlaps, the asymptotic behavior of the overlaps as a function of the real signal to noise ratio for all of these estimators is the same. So with this intuition, what does it mean that all these estimators have the same overlap? It means that the angle between uh, the estimator and the real signal you want to infer in all these cases is the same. So in a way, when the uh, prior is uniform on the sphere, all these estimators in a way uh, behave like, like as if, if they were PCA, but scaled with some constant, which is different in every case. One important uh, thing that I don't think I mentioned before is that while the characterization of 
uh, the mismatch patient estimator was restricted exclusively to the uh, uniform prior on the sphere. The characterization of the, this wrong Gaussian AMP does not require that. So you can assume some general factorized prior or spherical prior. It's okay. But in the special case in which the prior is uh, uniform on the sphere, you have that all these estimators have the same overlap, which tells you that they are essentially PCA with different uh, uh, adaptive norms. Okay, so to close a little bit the talk, we have all these asymptotic characterizations on all this family of estimators in this heavily mismatched setting in which the statistician completely forgets, completely disregards the structure of the noise. And we see that this heavy mismatch in the model brings this complex phenomena into the picture. It makes all the relationship between all these estimators that in the situation in which there is no mismatch, uh, they all coincide, makes all these interesting behaviors in different settings. In particular, I think one of the, like, the take home uh, messages is that in this setting, we have that the Gaussian AMP and the Bayesian estimator, although they are implementing the same model, the estimator in the end, uh, they do not match. So the mismatch makes these two things to, to differ. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. If I have many questions, so if no one wants to start, <laughs> I'll, I'll kick in. Um, so you told us what is the price of ignorance, but I was curious whether you ask um, if you have any insight about the opposite question, like the price of knowledge. So if I had like some underlying model, which is just like the standard one with ignorant noise, yeah. but uh, for some reason, you know, I read your paper, so I know like, you know, let, let me use just orthogonally invariant AMP. Would, it, would you think that I would pay a price for that as well or? somehow that would adapt to... You mean the situation in which you're trying to kill a fly with a bazooka? Exactly, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't re really know. But that's an interesting question. Like, if you overdo it instead of... Exactly, yeah. so it. a statistician, like, you know, I don't know what the model of the data, but let me use the most powerful um, spectral estimator that I have out there. Um, do they pay a price if the model is simpler than... I guess in that case, if, I mean, if you really want to use this kind of base optimal algorithm, the first thing you would need to, to do is to have information about the spectrum, because if not, you would always be in a mismatch setting, which wouldn't be kind of optimal. But it's still interesting to, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have other ones. <laughs> Thank you, Manuel. It was really Thanks. nice. Please, could you go back to slide 16? 16? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that wasn't clear to me is like, uh, how does this Z is related to the ground truth noise Z? This is a real ground truth noise. So what we did is to really analyze a problem in which <coughs> it's like an auxiliary problem that you need to analyze theoretically to be able to access this quantity Q in the overlap, which is needed to characterize the MSE. And in this case, you have to analyze a kind of more generic problem in which you have the real noise, Z, plus a little component of an extra noise, which is Gaussian. But the Z is the same as in the model you want to characterize. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Please, can you go to this slide where you have a PCA OPT and uh, uh, this one? No, no, no. There is where you have um, where you rank which one is the best. And, ah, okay, the graphs. Uh, for example, yeah, all of these settings. So, which? Yeah, you said, if I'm not mistaken, you said uh, PCA OPT is the best. Are you saying that, uh, like, for example, in uh, in future selection, in a like data set, for example, we used to. Sorry, sorry? In a like data set, for example, yeah. we used to use PCA to 
so like a dimensional reduction of uh, of the data set before we yeah. use it for machine learning. Are you in this case? Are you with your own uh, research? Are you saying your with your observation or with what you have done? Is this the best we can use at? In, in the best is PCA, but with a scaling constant. Remember that when we define the PCA, we said there are three variants of PCA. There are like real PCA that, uh, I'm going whatever place. Now the jet lag is starting to kick in. Luckily it started to happen in the end of the talk. Uh, here, you see we have three variants of PCA. One which is just PCA, so you, you just construct the rank one matrix coming from uh, the eigenvector from, with the largest eigenvalue. And the optimal one is what we call optimal PCA, which has a constant in front and this constant is a function of the signal to noise ratio that has the, all the information about uh, the spectral distribution of the noise matrix. So this is like a really smart PCA in a way. And that smart PCA is the one that is optimal and achieving the minimum MSC, which is this one. Any other? Yep. Um, if you don't have rotation invariance, but you still have a formula for the free energy, are you able to do a similar analysis with the AMP in those settings? If you have... If you do not have rotation invariance, but so instead of using the formulas for the um, spherical integrals, you have another way to compute the free energy. Are you still able to, to um, do the AMP analysis or is just rotation invariance important when you do the PCA analysis as well? I am a bit confused. You mean uh, for the Bayesian estimator, uh, so you don't have a uniform prior on the sphere, so... That's right, but, but let's say you, are, you have some other way to, to basically um, compute all of these um, quantities. Are you still able to, to, um, to um, can do some AMP in, in the other settings to... to yeah, uh, the result for AMP that I forgot to say at the, uh, at the moment, uh, you don't require for rotational invariance of the signal. Oh, okay, okay. The signal can be whatever prior that is factorized or... It's much more general, this, yeah. Thanks. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? So if this result here, the uh, state evolution for this is not Gaussian, is that correct? Or are these it's a Gaussian? state evolution coming from this auxiliary problem that has the state evolution of the orthogonal ensemble A and B. So it involves all the cumulants and... It's a complex expression. Uh -huh. So these variables here, these x1, x2. I didn't x2, write yeah. everything because it's a mess, you know. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> uh. Okay, but I just wanted to clarify. So the, the so even the x's here are not Gaussian variables in the limit. Just the x's. You mean these x's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so they but have all these extra is. terms. They right, are not. So none of this. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Can I ask another more basic question? So in the, in the very last slide that you have on page 22, I think it was. 22? This one? Right, so you have this comparison saying that all of them uh, achieve the same overlap. I was wondering, do, do you also have a simulation of this in a non-spherically uh, invariant signal case? And then what does that comparison look like? I'm just curious. Uh, I think we did some simulations for AMP for the overlap but because we didn't have a comparison with a Bayesian estimator, because the result for the Bayesian estimator is only on a uniform prior on the sphere. Sure. We didn't plot them. I don't remember. You should ask uh, Marco if you want okay. to. Okay, thanks. He was the one running the simulations. Okay. Um, maybe I have a my last question. Is uh, putting my physicist hat, uh, if I understand correctly, like all your results are done by computing explicitly these spherical integrals. Yeah. So do we, we know that when we have mismatch, usually we have RSB. So from, from the paper of Fabrizio, Antonucci, and so on, when we mismatch the likelihood. Yeah. Um, do we know uh, here uh, what kind of uh, structure of the measure we have, like which level of RSB or if it is RS? Uh, because we didn't use any of these kind of techniques, we went directly to spherical integral. It's not clear. Uh, 
the structure of uh, the replica symmetry breaking or not. But we had some discussion, John, about this. You remember? And we were, we had this kind of heuristic argument, which might be wrong, mm. that was pointing to the fact that this was not replica symmetric, right? We never knew for yeah. sure. It Maybe we can discuss this at some point yeah. if you want. It probably is, I mean, from, from the paper of Fabrizio, at least in the case where you just mismatch the SNR, like your first, first, first plot, yeah. we know that I think two is not in the 80 line. So, but uh, yeah, but probably in general, I think would not be RS. It's a, we thought about it for a while. We had this heuristic argument, which we were not completely sure we, <laughs> it was correct, <laughs> which, kind of pointed out that there was a kind of replica symmetry breaking, but that was, had a really simple structure, like not kind of Sherrington Kirkpatrick model replica symmetry breaking. But maybe we can discuss it. I think it's interesting, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Welcome. if there is not other questions, let's thank Manuel again.